Well, good morning, everybody. My name is Kobe. I am the pastor here at Ecclesia Clear Lake. I want to welcome you to our streaming service this morning. As we get started today, I need you to gather a few items from your home for the service. So first, I need you to, to get a Bible or, or some way to look up the passage we'll be studying this morning. I need you to get a pen and a pencil or, or some, I'm sorry, a pen and some paper or some way to, to, to write some things down during the service. And then also, I need you to Google the lyrics to the song, Praise to the Lord, the Almighty. I don't have any fancy lyrics scrolling up in this service. So you have those things? You're ready to go? All right. I got some really important announcements. Starting on June 20th, we will be resuming regular in-person gatherings. I'm so excited to be saying those words. Now, I told you earlier, as we continue to transition into this phase, what's really important to me is that what we do is meaningful, that what we do is manageable for our personnel, and what we do continues to be safe. So keep those three words in mind. June 20th is an outdoor gathering under our oak tree out front. We need you to bring your own lawn chair. We're going to start at 10 a.m. and we will have a hymn sing led by various members of our community. It's going to be a really special morning. June 27th is going to be different. Now, it will be outside under the oak tree, but we're going to have a, a picnic lunch and have some lit liturgy around the picnic lunch. Since we're eating, we're not starting at 10. We're starting at 11 o'clock a.m. So make sure you write that down or you put an alarm on your phone or something to remind you. On June 27th, it starts at 11. Now for that service, you need to bring your own chair, you need to bring your own lunch, and bring some communion elements. For both of those services, since they're outdoors, masks are optional. And for both of those services, we, don't, we won't have registration. Come, spread out, and we can worship God together. Now starting on July 4th, we will resume regular in-person indoor gatherings. That service will resume at 10 a.m. like usual. For our indoor services, we need you to pre-register. We're setting the limit at first to 60 registrants, including all those who are volunteering, so that we can spread out the seats and, and continue to, to do this safely. We're also asking people who come to the indoor meetings to wear a mask so we can continue to do these services safely. Now, the registration will be open the week prior to the service, and so make sure you continue to check your email, check the website. Some of this information is subject to change. This is what we know right now, but go ahead and keep checking your email and the website so you can stay up to date with all the information and all the ways we are, are, are moving forward and continuing to learn how to embody love and gather as a community. And now, one more announcement, uh, just to let you know, for the next three weeks, my family and I will be on vacation. We're going to be traveling a little. We'll be around town, but I'll be on vacation. So if you need something, if something comes up, you need some sort of pastoral care or there's some sort of uh, emergency and you need to talk to somebody, please reach out to one of our elders. The elder contact info is on the church website. And now I invite you to, to sing this song of praise with me as we enter into worship. Prepare your heart and your mind for worship. The song is Praise to the Lord, the Almighty. We will be singing verses 1, 2, and 4. Praise to the Lord, the Almighty, the King of creation. All my soul praise
you join me in prayer? <sighs> Holy God, you are worthy of our praise. On the days that we feel your presence fully with us, on the days where it feels as though you are distant, Lord, you are worthy of our praise. Lord, we ask you to, to stir inside of us, Lord. Help us to be aware of the many ways you are at work, the ways that you bring healing, the ways that you bring deliverance, the ways that you bring transformation in our lives as individuals and in our communities. And Lord, as you heal us, Lord, will you empower us to go embody love? Will you empower us to live out this gospel among our, our friends, to live out this gospel among our neighbors? Lord, today we, we acknowledge that we need you. And so for those of us who have heavy hearts today, Lord, will you comfort us? For those of us who are struggling to, to pay the bills, Lord, will you remind us that with you all things are possible? For those of us who may be feeling lonely, Lord, will you, great sustainer, great counselor, show up in a powerful way and remind us we are never alone. And Lord, teach us as we study your word today. Empower us, transform us, make a way in us. We ask these things in your holy name. Amen. Amen. I apologize, my neighbors are mowing their yard. Isn't this so um, very much a 2020-21 thing? So if you hear some background noise, I apologize. Well, for as long as I can remember, I have been singing. Most of the time, I don't even know that I'm singing. Like just the other day, I was at the dentist's office and I was seeing a, a brand new dentist and she came into the, the, the room while I was on the, the, the examining chair and she said, oh, you a singer? And I thought, well, that's a weird question to ask at the dentist's office. Do I have singer teeth? <laughs> but then I realized like in that moment, I, I was humming and I didn't even know it. And then she said, I hum all the time too. It was a really sweet moment. But I love to sing. I'm constantly singing or humming, and, I, and I'm not always even aware that I'm doing that. But I also love really good lyrics. Lyrics have a way of painting pictures with words, of articulating emotions, even when it feels like they're inexpressible. They have a way of telling stories about the totality of the human experience. As an early teen, I, I spent hours playing Mario Kart and listening to Boys to Men with my friend, Tim. Those, those, those four men, it's like they got me, you know? There's four of them, right? There, there may be five, I can't, I can't remember. But the lyrics I actually poured over the most were written by a man named Rich Mullins. Now, I, it was kind of a latecomer to Rich Mullins. He passed away in 1997, and I didn't really start listening to his music till 1998 or 1999. But what I found in his lyrics were, were some, some honesty that, that I rarely saw or heard in Christian music. He had this raw and authentic way of talking about the faith journey in a, in a way that made it feel accessible and real. For example, in one of his songs, he, he talks about how loneliness is, is a natural part of life. In most of my Christian upbringing, I thought that if I was lonely, it was because of some sort of sin in my life. But sure enough, this is what he wrote. This life has shown me how we're wounded and how we're torn. How it's okay to be lonely as long as you're free. Loneliness is a, is a natural part of the faith journey. One of the last songs he wrote, he, he talks about how, how Jesus had to rely on the generosity of friends and strangers in order for him to meet his own needs. He, he did not live his life to build wealth and to seek after fame. Now, this is a really significant lesson for me as I was going through business school in my late teens, early 20s. These are the lyrics of the song. Birds have nests. Foxes have bins, but the hope of the whole world rests on the shoulders of a homeless man. He had the shoulders of a homeless man. 
and the world can't stand what it can't own and it can't own you because you did not have a home. Those are some powerful lyrics, right? I love music. I, I love good beats. I love authentic lyrics. I love it all. Which is why I'm really excited about the text we are studying this morning together. We are going to be looking at an ancient song. Now, we don't know the original melody, nor do we probably, none of us probably speak the original language the song was in. But we do have a great translation in our Bible. We're going to be in Psalm 138. It's one of the lectionary texts for today. Now, I love the Psalms for, for many reasons. You know, the, the Psalms reflect on many of the great attributes of God. We can learn quite a bit about who God is and how God relates to humanity by reading the Psalms. But the psalmists, like all good lyricists, write about the human experience. They describe the highs and the lows of the faith journey. They talk about freedom and fear. They talk about faith and doubt. They talk about joy and pain. There's even passages about love, but also about hate and anger towards one's enemy. Our psalm today is attributed to King David. It's, it's primarily a psalm of praise. And so as we read the text today, I want you to, to think about these two prompts. And this is where the pen and paper come in handy. I want you to think about what this song teaches us about the human faith journey. I also want you to think about what this song teaches us about the nature of God. And so as we read the text, make sure you, you highlight those things. I'm going to list a few of the things I noticed, but it's, it's likely that you're going to find something that's a little different than I found. And I think that's important to note. And so now will you join me in reading Psalm 138? I give you praise, O Lord, with my whole heart. Before the gods, I sing your praise. I bow down toward your holy temple and give thanks to your name for your steadfast love and your faithfulness. For you have exalted your name and your word above everything. On the day I called you, you answered me. You increased my strength of my soul. All the kings of the earth, they shall praise you, O Lord, for they have heard the words of your mouth. They shall sing of the ways of the Lord, the great and the glory of the Lord. For though the Lord is high, he regards the lowly, but the haughty he perceives from far away. Though I walk in the midst of trouble, you preserve me against the wrath of my enemies. You stretch out your hand. Your right hand delivers me. The Lord will fulfill his purpose for me. Your steadfast love, O Lord, endures forever. Do not forsake the work of your hands. Why don't we first begin to talk about the ways this ancient song teach us, teaches us about the human faith journey. Now, from the jump, we see something is happening in the lyricist, in the poet, because of how God works. There seems to be this overwhelming emotion of thankfulness. Now, he's not just kind of giving a, a casual thanks like we do when we pick up our nuggets from Chick-fil-A. He says that, that his whole heart, from, from the depths of who he is, thankfulness is pouring out of his lips. In this text, it sounds like David is in a place where he feels the fullness of God, where he feels aware of the movement of God. And for that, he is very thankful. But as we dive in, even though this is a psalm of praise, not every psalm is a psalm of praise. There's sometimes, like in Psalm 22, where the psalmists feel like God has forsaken them. And so just know that even though this text, um, in this text, the psalmist can't help but sing praises and, and, and thanks, uh, songs of thanksgiving to the Lord, sometimes thankfulness has to be a discipline. Sometimes we don't feel thankful, but it's an important spiritual discipline because whenever we are intentional with our thanksgiving to the Lord, it reminds us of the ways God has provided in the past. 
It reminds us of who God is. It reminds us of how God will continue to see us through, even though life is hard and painful. And so some of us today may already be feeling thankful. Great. God is here. This is good. But some of us may not be feeling thankful. But just know, if that's you, God is still here. God is still good. Now, the second part of the first verse reveals another important aspect of the human faith journey. It's something that jumped out to me. I don't know if it jumped out to you. In the second part of verse 1, David wrote that he will worship Yahweh before the other gods with a little G. At first, that looked a little peculiar to me, and I, and I think that's because we don't usually talk about other gods in our culture. But that doesn't mean we don't have them. <laughs> a few years ago, I was meeting with a, a pastor, and I just want to let you know that this pastor has a beautiful heart for the Lord. This pastor is passionate about ministry, has really good intentions. But in this particular case, we were talking about a ministry this pastor had launched in another country. And this country, it was, it was in this place where they didn't have much monetary wealth. And the way she talked about it was kind of gave me a, a sinking feeling because she kind of talked about it as, as though they were just these really poor people who needed our help. We were the ones who could help and save these people. And she began to tell a story about how, you know, these people, missionaries had come to them long, long ago, and many of them professed to be Christians. However, if you went into their homes, you could still see small shrines to gods of their people. And she said these words, and then she said, like, can you believe that they, they still worship these other gods? And my, my response was, oh, wow, that sounds a lot like American Christianity. <laughs> and she looked at me puzzled. Now, I, I believe that every human on earth has other gods that we worship, gods with a little G. It's just in our culture, we don't call them gods. We don't necessarily build shrines to them. We don't necessarily offer sacrifices to them, at least not, not that we're aware of. But we do center our lives around all sorts of things that are not the triune God. We do pledge our allegiance to all sorts of things that are not the one true God. It's important for us to acknowledge the gods of our culture. Otherwise, we may be seduced into worshiping them without even knowing it. And so I want you to do something today, maybe now, maybe later. But in the presence of the, the God who is love and grace, I want you to consider what it is in our culture that we put before God. Another way to ask the, this question is, what are the values in our country that do not reflect the love, mercy, holiness, justice, and righteousness of God? It's likely that these things can become our gods with a little G. And so again, in the presence of the Holy Spirit, wrestle with that prompt. Now, in the psalm, we learn quite a bit about the human faith experience, but we also learn quite a bit about who God is and how God interacts with humanity. In the psalm, we learn that God is faithful. God has steadfast love. This psalm talks about kings, and so we can think about it as political leaders. Did you, did you catch that? That He said that the, even the kings will worship you. So what we could say is even our, our political leaders in whom we put our trust, in whom we put our hope, they will have to come to terms with their own limitations. One day they too will worship the one true God. God is the one divine being, the one all-powerful being, not our, not our political leaders. In this psalm, we also learn that God is, is not only high and, and powerful, but God is intentionally purposeful. God is with the lowly. Now, that's a, that's a very radical and perhaps even new paradigm for power. It's not a paradigm rooted in, in some sort of self-centered uh, quest for, for gaining power and, and gaining popularity and, and, and gaining wealth. It's a paradigm of power that is rooted in God's glory, 
which is also rooted in, the, in human flourishing. Because God, when God is glorified, that leads to human flourishing. And so those things are intertwined. This is the paradigm for power that, that exists with the kingdom of God. In this psalm, we learn that though our faith journey will be full of pain and frustration, God is still there. God will still provide. God will be the ultimate deliverer. Now, even if our faith wavers, God is steadfast. God will not waver. Now, at the end of the, the text, there's this little twist I'm not sure if you caught it, but, it, but it, it's the last line, the last little phrase of this particular psalm. It, it kind of caught my attention. The psalmist just spent a ton of time talking about the human faith journey and, and confessing and, and professing that God is good, God is powerful, God is here. But then the psalmist ends like this. He says, you will fulfill your purposes for me. And then he says, do not forsake the work of your hands. I thought that was interesting. Because if God was faithful, God was, you know, trustworthy, why on earth would we need to say those things, right? I like how the message version translates that last verse. He says, finish what you started in me, O God. Don't quit on me now. I love that that's included in this psalm because, again, I think this, this sums up the faith journey. Even on those days where we feel aware of God's presence, where we are praising God for the great and powerful ways God works, even on those days, we can have a little bit of doubt. We can have a little fear that God won't show up. But thankfully, every single time, it's like God responds, Never will I leave you nor forsake you. That is not in my nature. So simply come. As you are, come, I am here with you. Come as you are, I'm ready. Whew. I love the Psalms. The Psalms help ignite my imagination for the, for the ways God works and, and how God relates to humanity. The Psalms remind me that we are indeed humans in pursuit of the one true God. And so we come as humans. That's an important thing to pay attention to. The Psalm also teaches us that God desires us to come with our full selves. Whether we're flying high in the sky or, or sinking low in the pits of despair, again, God is there inviting us to show up with intentional authenticity and courageous vulnerability. That's the invitation today, and that is the invitation, well, every day. And so as we close today, I want to encourage you or invite you to do this little activity with me. Go ahead and get your, your pen and, and your paper out. And I want you to try writing a, a psalm to the Lord this morning. And so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to close my eyes and I'm going to guide you through this process. But consider this a, a, an act of prayer, an act of, of praise, an act of pouring yourself out to the Lord. Take a couple of breaths, center yourself. Perhaps it helps to imagine that you are in the presence of God. To begin, start your psalm with, with praise and adoration. Maybe it'll be helpful to describe the, the attributes of God that most connect with you today. And if it's hard to feel connected to God, well, maybe, maybe write about the attributes of God that you need most in your life today. I'll give you a few seconds.
From praise and adoration, we then go to a section devoted to remembering. Reflect on a time or instance that God moved in a meaningful way in your life. It could be something simple like a a friend reminding you that you are loved. Or it could be something that feels really significant like a time you were in in a crunch for money and God provided, God delivered you. But simply take some time to reflect on God's faithfulness. From remembering, I, I want to invite you into a space of of grieving or lament. I think I've shared with you before, I don't create enough space for that sort of prayer in my own life. And so I want you to, to kind of get in tune with what you're carrying with you today. And, and if there are any you know heaviness that you're carrying or any grief that you're carrying... Simply present those to the Lord and and just kind of name those in the presence of the Lord. You can ask God to be your comfort. You can ask God to be your, your guide and your peace. Next, I'd like you to consider moving into a a time of confession. Consider the ways in your life, the the things that you're maybe doing or thinking or, or, or not doing that are keeping you from healthy relationships. Healthy relationships with God, healthy relationships with others, healthy relationships with the self. I invite you to lay those things at the feet of our God, who is good. Confess these things, ask for forgiveness, and seek to turn away from those things. And if you have, if you feel prompted to do so, you can actually write about those things in the psalm. There's plenty of examples of that in our scripture. close this psalm, I I invite you to end with words of thanksgiving. Thanking God for God's kindness, God's mercy, God's goodness, God's faithfulness, and anything else that's kind of bubbling up in your heart. Will you join me in prayer? God, I don't know about my friends listening in today, but I know for me, sometimes it's hard for me to slow down and, and listen. Listen to what's going on inside of me, listening, listen to what you're doing in me or around me. But today, Lord, I, I know that I need that. So, Lord, thank you for your patience. I feel like most of my life I, I try to do things my own way and, and the whole time you're just sitting there patiently and lovingly saying, okay, okay, I'm still here. I'll be here when you need me. <laughs> um, Lord, thank you for your love. Thank you for your grace. Lord, I ask you to be with my friends today, wherever they are. Help them know that they are loved by you, that they are seen by you. And Lord, help us to do something with this love, Lord. Help us to replicate this love for one another, but also for our neighbors, for our community, for those we might not even like, Lord. 
teach us to love as you love. We ask these things in your holy name. Amen. Amen. Well, I hope that that experience was was meaningful for you. And I encourage you to, to practice this maybe once a week or maybe once a month, whatever fits with your rhythms. But simply take some time and reflect and write your own psalm. Another way you can do that, by the way, is you can read a psalm that you love in, in the text and simply reword it to fit your context. My wife Tammy does that at least once or twice a year with the 23rd Psalm, and it's, it's powerful every single time. Well, now I'd like to invite you to receive this benediction. But this benediction, I want us to, to sing together. I told you I like to sing. And so what we're going to do is actually sing the benediction. I'm sorry, we're going to sing the doxology for our benediction. Praise God from whom all blessings flow. Praise God, all creatures here below. Praise God above ye heavenly hosts. Praise Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. Amen. Go in peace, church.